फ्रेंड्स माय नेम इज डॉक्टर पार्थ पारेख आई एम अ कंसल्टेंट एक्सक्लूसिव ऑर्थोपेडिक फुट एंड एंकल सर्जन हियर इन अहमदाबाद आई एम प्रैक्टिसिंग फुल टाइम एट सिम्स हॉस्पिटल आई एम द वन एंड ओनली फुट एंड एंकल स्पेशलिस्ट इन अहमदाबाद हु एक्सक्लूसिवली प्रैक्टिसेस इन द फील्ड ऑफ ऑर्थोपेडिक्स आई हैव गेन्ड माय ट्रेनिंग फ्रॉम ऑर्थोपेडिक फुट एंड एंकल सेंटर कोलंबस ओहायो व्हिच इज रिगार्डेड एज़ वन ऑफ द बेस्ट इंस्टीट्यूट्स इन द वर्ल्ड एंड आई हैव बीन प्रैक्टिसिंग सिंस लास्ट 6 इयर्स and uh, we, today we will be talking about uh, diabetes and uh, the problems that we face in foot and ankle region because of diabetes uh, it is one of the most uh, important diseases uh, in the uh, facing in the world these days and today we will be talking about that and uh, after the introduction of my fellow colleague we will be starting the talk on that thank you Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Vivek Patel. I am consultant endocrinologist at Sims Hospital. I am taking care of uh, diabetes, thyroid, and other hormone-related problems uh, uh, who are presented at the Sims Hospital. Uh, today, we'll be discussing about the diabetes management in a special population. Uh, specifically, we are talking about the elderly population, as we all know that uh, uh, world population, Indian population, is aging. and we see many and many uh, diabetic patients who are in the age of 60 70s we'll be talking about how the diabetes management changes in this kind of uh, elderly population and uh, what precautions and what points needs to be considered while managing this kind of patients uh, in my talk thank you so my topic is newer trends in management of diabetes as of now uh let's just get some basics right in uh, what is diabetes and how diabetes affects the foot so the 15% of diabetic developed diabetic foot ulcers once in their lifetime and out of those 15% 14% lead to amputations the degree of metabolic control presence of ischemia infection and continuing trauma to the excessive plantar pressure also poorly fitting shoes may lead to the development and the uh, hindrance in healing so these are the risk factors for diabetic foot ulcer they are general as well as local general something like hyperglycemia uh, for more than 10 years peripheral vascular diseases blindness older age high body mass index local uh, uh, effects would be trauma callus peripheral uh, neuropathy structural foot de uh, deformities and as i said uh, ill fitting shoes uh the basic etiology of how this works is there are three main things ischemia neuropathic or combined neuroischemic abnormalities uh 10% of diabetic foot ulcers are pure ischemic and 90% of them are neuropathic along with ischemia so uh, peripheral sensory motor and autonomic neuropathy is the most common pathway uh, where the neuropathy may lead to trauma and again lead to ulceration and again impaired healing so it's a vicious cycle going on uh the pathophysiology which uh, diabetes mellitus is mainly concerned is into three sensory motor and autonomic uh the sensory of course will lead to decrease in pain temperature and proprioception which will lead to a neuropathic foot uh, motor will lead to a muscle changes foot deformities and again in increased plantar pressure the autonomic is decreased sweating dry skin callus formation as well as the impaired birth form so all of them are uh, lead to a stage where their neuro uh, the foot is at risk for the neuropathic uh, system uh, these are the different classifications uh, which are generally right now followed there are wagner university of texas pedis and sinbad each one has their own advantage and the disadvantage the first one uh, does not address the infection and ischemia uh, university of texas does that and it also predicts the outcome of the diabetic foot ulcers uh, the pedis is more user friendly and the sinbad is actually uh, better in terms of that it includes the ulcer site data also uh, the wagner which is most commonly used is from grade 0 to 5 uh, depending on the ulcers and how it is so open lesion superficial then going to the tendons uh, affecting the bones gangrene and uh, entire foot gangrene Uh, what are the advanced treatments now that are going on so topical growth factors are now uh, used bioengineered skin grafts uh, vacuum assisted uh, closure and hyperbaric oxygen therapy i am going to talk all of them uh, later on they are all available in india now uh, and evidence of improved healing compared to the standard wound care is already there due, uh, from certain articles 
So these are the main headings I will be talking about. They are the microbiological control, the wound control, metabolic control, vascular control, mechanical, and educational. So let's start with microbiological. So most of the diabetic infections are polymicrobial. We use broad spectrum for a long duration time, and that's why the poor immune response also in diabetics, hence the normal skin commensals can cause serious infections, even the smallest ones. Uh, the wound control, generally what we do is irrigate the wound with saline, povidone, iodine. And now there is a new um, uh, hypochlorous acid, which is the VASH, uh, which uh, can take us, uh, control of the gram-positive, negative, as well as anaerob anaerobes and fungi. Uh, generally what is done is the gauze, gauze is soaked in a VASH solution and kept for the 14 to 10, 20 minutes. Uh, debridement is basically what we used to do till now and are still going on. Uh, that's the removal of revitalized tissue with sharp blunt dissection. Uh, two modalities now are going on are ultrasonic debridement as well as the biodebridement. So the ultrasonic debridement is a form, uh, what, is done, uh, what it does is a formation and uh, collapse of vapor bubbles that fragments and infill, uh, em emulsifies the necrotic tissue without disturbing the viable tissue. So only the uh, tissue which is bad is going to be affected by that. And the removal of particulate matter and reduction of bacterial counts. So this is how uh, it's generally done. Uh, deep tunneling where the debr uh, debridement with other technique is difficult uh, and there's alpha, uh, uh, almost no blood loss. Biodebridement or maggot therapy is also can be used, which is a green butterfly. Um, the indications are specific as well as the contraindications are very specific for this. Indications are infected or sluffy wounds, necrotic area on the diabetic foot, necrotizing fasciitis, and infection with MRSA. Uh, the contraindications have to be very properly understood in this kind of a therapy. That is fistulae, wounds that connect with the vital organs like the brain, uh, which connect with the cavities like the abdomen, uh, and which are near the um, main blood vessels. So the advantage of the uh, maggot therapy is they do not disturb the normal host tissue. Uh, good debridement with removal of dead necrotic tissue and elimination of infection is seen. Uh, but the only thing is it is costly and difficult to get short shelf life patient can have uncomfortable clotting sensation because of the maggots vacuum assisted closure uh, the basic components are the plastic tubing the canister uh, the computerized treatment unit as well as the granuform uh, dressing what the principle is the uh, cleaning and debridement uh, with the special uh, granuform dressing applied uh, to the site connected to the special computerized unit and with plastic tub uh, tubing with 125 mm hg negative pressure what it does is reduces the edema exudates and the bacterial load and regeneration of granulation tissue and neovascularization is seen. This is an, again a newer trend which is coming on is the autolo gel or autologous platelet rich plasma. The way you take PRP is the same here, you centrifugate and uh, then it is give, uh, put in a reagent uh, like thrombin as well as the activate uh, the platelets and it makes a, a gel like consistency that is what is known as autolo gel. And gel is applied over the wound twice a week uh, for 12 weeks. And one of the studies shows that it has around 68.4% uh, better results than the normal uh, user. Uh, another uh, thing is the O2 Micelli. Uh, patient puts the lower limb in a canister of O2 Micelli machine and wound is exposed to four cycles of 100% oxygen, and which is for five minutes each, alternatively with vapor or water and antibiotics. This is done for twice a week for 12 weeks. Uh, then we have the lower level laser therapy. Uh, wound is exposed to the lower level therapy machine, which activates the microcirculation and macrophages, leading to anti inflammatory, analgesic, and regenerative bactericidal uh, clinical effects. Uh, this is that machine over here. This is that machine. Um, now, the growth factors, which are the growth factors which are generally used uh, for diabetes uh, wound management, is that uh, Platelet derived growth factor, hepatocyte uh, growth factor, transforming growth factor alpha and beta, as well as the keratinocyte growth factors. Uh, platelet derived growth factor, as well as the epidermal derived gro uh, growth factors, are approved by the US FDA now. And most commonly used, plermin uh, is uh, also now you know, healing, uh, is also used for wound healing if used in non infected superficial wounds. Uh, ozone therapy, uh, it's now in, available in India and even in Ahmedabad, it's going on. Uh, it's a colorless, pungent odor gas, disinfects, oxidizes, and de uh, deodorizes. Uh, peripheral ozone therapy is very effective for badly infected and non-healing ulcers. Uh, the term is known as bagging, where you put the foot inside a bag kind of a thing, where you can see it on the picture. And it is exposed uh, 
to ozone therapy for 20 to 30 minutes and initially higher concentrations are used to control the infection and then the maintenance dose is there about 30 to 40 milligram uh, per milliliter hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, also has some uh, specific uh, indications that is gas gangrene necrotizing fasciitis decompression syndrome uh, skin grafts and flaps uh, so basically there are two types of hyperbaric uh, chambers one is monoplace and one is multiplace monoplace is where one individual can be there and the monoplace is where several individuals can uh, sit it's something like a big oil tanker uh, and uh, patient is placed uh, in that and he breathes about 100% oxygen un under increased that is two to three times atmospheric pressure that is for 90 to 120 minutes two hours um, this increases the tissue oxygen tension angiogenesis fibroblast proliferation collagen deposition and enhanced bacterial killing that is bactericidal effect given for five days a week total 20 to 40 such treatments are given depending upon the size and severity of the wound Improved wound heal healing and reduced rate of amputations were observed in significant number of uh, diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, uh, there's an article by Ms. Uh, Stone. A skin graft, again, this is a new technique where uh, the foreskin of uh, newborns are taken and uh, they, are, uh, they are used as a bioengineered graft. And indication for that is the chronic non-healing uh, ulcers or the superficial venous ulcers. Uh, coming to metabolic control, control of blood sugar and general parameters equally important. Uh, start insulin if wound is large, infected and necrotic and if patient is in septicemia, looks toxic or has DKH. Vascular control, again, uh, these you guys already know. Um, mechanical control is offloading, which is very important. Uh, if the uh, patient has diabetic ulcers, uh, it has increased plantar pressure. So offloading is a system where the pressure which is there on the foot is taken away and the pressures at, at different places are there then uh, so there is a total contact cast till now we were using or a plaster of paris cast newer modalities are already there we have the front offloading the back offloading the middle offloading all of the pictures uh, suggest that uh, we in our practice are using offloading uh, to the maximum right now uh, so for summary uh, most common cause of hospitalization in diabetes is the diabetic foot uh, problems Minor ulcers can lead to amputation, so one has to be very cautious about that. Uh, diabetic foot ulcer is not improving. One should refer the case to a foot and ankle specialist. And apart from uh, blood sugar control, treatment of ulcer involves debridement, offloading appropriate dressings, vascular maintenance, and infection control. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So the next session is on the diabetes management in elderly because the elderly population is growing very much fast and the diabetes is or the disease of aging. And because of that, the diabetes population in the elderly is also very large. So if we see that the world is growing older, uh, the age more than 65 year in 2016 is 8.5%, around 617 million, which subjected to rise to almost double to 17% in uh, 2050. Also, the very elderly people, that is more than 80, are also going to rise over a period of time. And among the older population, the non-communicable diseases are the major health concern. So if we see the current uh, health scenario, type 2 diabetes scenario in the elderly population, the one in the five people with diabetes is above 65 years of age. Uh, this is the latest 2019 data. And almost 13 million more adults of uh, are above 65 year of age since 2017 so in in almost two years there is rise in 13 million patients of elderly diabetic patients and uh, why this is so because of uh, the uh, improved intervention improved medical facilities the uh, health span of the diabetic individual is rising and also because of the aging uh, the diabetes is also more prevalent in the elderly population. The risk factor being the lifestyle leading to obesity, some genetics, uh, comorbid conditions. Uh, this all leads to the uh, metabolic parameters, changes in the metabolic parameters, which lead to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Also, the, uh, with the aging, the diabetic complications are also on the rise. All the microvascular and the macrovascular complications are increasing with the aging. And this is related to the diabetes duration and also the other cardiometabolic risk factors. So uh, what are the challenges uh, in managing the 
uh, elderly type 2 diabetic patient. The first being the duration of the diabetes leading to the decrease in the beta cell function. Uh, many of the medications which are depend on the beta cell function or the insulin secretion may not be very effective in an uh, elderly population. Overall condition of the patients like frailty, cognitive uh, function and the patient may require support of the other family members for the diabetes management. Comorbid conditions, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension also need to be addressed accurately. Uh, another thing is the renal function. Uh, with the aging, the renal function is uh, getting deteriorated and also in the diabetic patient, this, uh, this decline in the renal function is uh, very, very fast as compared to the non-diabetic patient. And because of uh, some medications like SGLT2 inhibitor, which depend on their uh, uh, depend on renal function for their efficacy may not be very effective in very elderly population and also the dosage of the other medication needs to be uh, changed according to the renal function. Also the risk of hypoglycemia, elderly population are at risk of hypoglycemia, erratic meal pattern or the inadequate calorie intake may lead to, they, they may, uh, may make them more prone to develop hypoglycemia and also with the hypoglycemia they are at, they are at high risk of uh, cardiovascular or the cerebrovascular accident. Also, the safety of medications, treatment adherence is also important as discussed in the previous session. Polypharmacy, because this elderly population, they are suffering from the multiple conditions and because of that, they are on multiple medication. The drug-to-drug -drug interaction needs to be considered when, when we are managing the elderly diabetic patient. Uh, let us go through one case. Uh, there is an 80-year-old male patient, known obese, uh, type 2 diabetes for 15 years, hypertensive, uh, CAD underwent uh, PTCA, LV dysfunction is present, EGFR is 40. So what should be the target, uh, the glycemic target for the HB1C in this patient? So first of all, we have to decide uh, that uh, a target needs to be decided depending on the general condition of the patient. So patient needs to be evaluated first uh, with his functional status, uh, de uh, cognition, depression, uh, fall risk, fracture risk, uh, whether there is any habit or not. Also, the general health test, including the cardiovascular lipid profile, uh, uh, bone mineral density needs to be considered whenever we are using either pyoglutazone or SGLT2 inhibitor who are at high risk of fracture. And also, the di di diabetes specific uh, health should be assessed. And depending on that, the uh, target needs to be decided. Uh, the elderly patient can be divided into three groups. The first group is either uh, very much uh, okay. Uh, group uh, who has no other comorbid conditions. Patient has only one or two diabetes related complications and patient can maintain his average daily activity very well. Uh, the other group is the intermediate health uh, who has three or more uh, non-diabetic chronic illnesses or any one of the following like uh, cognitive impairment or the de uh, defect in the average daily activity. And last one is the poor health group who is either at the end, uh, end of life uh, and end-stage medical conditions, severe de dementia is there or patient is having more than two average daily activity impairment. Depending on that, we have to also decide that patient is using which drug to control uh, his or her blood sugar. So if a patient is using like a, a medication which causes hypoglycemia like sulfonylurea, glenides or insulin, then the target can be a little bit uh, lighter as compared to the patient who are using only metformin or DPP-4 inhibitor, we can have some stricter target because of low risk of hypoglycemia. And depending on all this, the target should be decided. Let us go through the individual medications, how they behave in the uh, elderly population. So metformin is highly effective. Uh, it works in any stage of the diseases. Uh, there is minimum risk of hypoglycemia or the weight gain. However, with the declining age, uh, with the declining renal function with the age, uh, we have to monitor EGFR when we, whenever we are using metformin and also we have to titrate the dose of the metformin according to the EGFR. Also with the long-term use of the uh, 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 metformin, there is a risk of B12 deficiency needs to be addressed accordingly. Uh, Secretogogus, sulfonylurea and glenides, they are associated with high risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain. Uh, therefore, the longer acting and the older sulfonylurea should be avoided in elderly population. However, the modern sulfonylurea like glimipride, uh, modified acting glyclazide or the short acting sulfonylurea like glipizide or the glenides can be used safely in patients who are uh, elderly patients. However, the golden rule should be the uh, you should start these medications very low dose 
and titrate very slowly to avoid the risk of hypoglycemia. If we see the pyoglitazone, again, it is very effective, uh, effective in uh, any stage of the diabetes, even in elderly population. However, they are associated with risk of fluid retention and may precipitate or worsen the heart failure, which is also the uh, uh, aging complication of the diabetes. And therefore, it, it should be used cautiously in very elderly patients. Also, there is an increased risk of fracture. And therefore, when we are using in very elderly male or the postmenopausal women, we have to address the uh, risk of fracture before starting this bioglitazone. With the AGI, they are not very much efficacious. Modest efficacy is there uh, associated with GI side effect. And because of that GI side effect, the relative high rate of non-adherence, uh, especially in elderly population. Uh, if we see the DPP-4 inhibitor, the efficacy is beta cell dependent. So very late stage of diabetes may not be working uh, very good. Generally well tolerated, minimum risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain. Some heart failure risk is uh, noticed with the sexagliptin, but other DPP-4 inhibitors are safe. Uh, especially use of SGA82 inhibitor in very elderly should be cautious. Though its efficacy is uh, insulin independent, it depends on the renal function with the declining EGFR. The efficacy of this SGA82 inhibitor goes down, especially if the EGFR is less than 30. There is no risk of hypoglycemia. It actually causes weight reduction, but this may not be uh, useful in every elderly patient. Many of the elderly patients are lean, thin, frail patients. In those patients, this uh, weight reduction is not beneficial. There are CV and renal benefits. Also, we have to be uh, use this molecule cautiously because of risk of volume depletion, DKA, uh, urinary tract infection because of prostatism or the urinary incontinence, genital infection, and again, the fracture risk is also there. Regarding the GLP-1 analogs, uh, efficacy is partially beta cell dependent. Again, no hypoglycemia, weight reduction is there, CV renal benefit, but uh, because of GI adverse effect, the adherence is an issue and again, the cost is also the issue. Whenever we are using insulin, uh, they are highly efficacious, uh, but risk of uh, hypoglycemia and weight gain is there. Complexity of the regime, we need to be simplify insulin regime when, whenever we are prescribing in the elderly population, either using basal insulin or the use of co-formulation, especially in the morning, avoiding the evening dose to reduce the nighttime hypoglycemia. Patient may require third person support for the injection uh, uh, injection of the insulin. And again, the adherence will be an issue. So there are clear cut guidelines are there to simplify the insulin regime. And lastly, the take home message will be the elderly diabetic population is growing. They present with the special challenges. We have to individualize target depending on the patient condition as well as the medications which we are using. And we have to choose therapy wisely to avoid the possible adverse events. Thank you. Uh, should I start answering the questions? Yeah, so uh, there are three questions uh, which are there on the live messenger uh, related to me. I'll just complete them. First one is uh, what is a non healing ulcer and how do you treat it? So let's just understand first what is the ulcer. Uh, when a diabetic patient is there, the sensory loss is there in the foot. So basically, you just got to understand that if you uh, if you are going through a rough patch of road where pebbles are there or a very hot surface uh, of the road or a, at home or you get hit by something, a, a small trauma, a patient who is a diabetic and has no sensory uh, uh, reception to it, he is not going to realize that. So he's going going on walking on that. So what happens is then skin kind of cracks over that area. Uh, just uh, imagine if you have a, a finger on a stove and if it's hot, you're going to take it away. But the g person who has no sensations over there, he's going to keep on walking on that and the skin starts developing cracks and everything. Secondly, if you have a trauma, you uh, you, you you hurt your foot or you fall down, uh, the person is not going to realize that. If you, if you hurt your hand and you have a fracture, you're going to, you know, take care of it. But the, the person who has diabetes and a sensory loss is not going to know that. So he's keeping on walking on those kind of uh, uh, fractures. So what happens is undue pressures come on the uh, on the uh, on the bones on the foot, and the person doesn't realize he goes on walking on that, and sk skin starts cracking up. Once that happens, you still go on uh, walking on that. The ulcers develop. Now again, ulcers are of two types. One is an infective ulcer and a non-infective ulcer. 
So if it's a non-infective ulcer, what you basically do is the ulcer is there, but it's not healing because it's you are going on walking on that. So basic principle is to offload the foot. What me means is that you just don't walk on that foot. You don't uh, either you have a plaster cast on that or a, if a patient is very amicable and understanding, just tell him not to walk on that foot. So the regeneration takes place, fibrosis takes place and the skin is covered. Second is the an uh, infective uh, non-healing ulcer. What happens is when you're walking, dust and other particles come inside, bacteria comes inside and it becomes an infective non-healing ulcer. In this, it's a completely different uh, way of managing it. First, if the infection is just in the skin or the subcutaneous area, which is just uh, before the bones, you kind of debride it, which I've talked in the, uh, in the talk. You give antibiotics, you do proper dressing and you make sure that the infection has gone away and then try to manage and kind of try to close the wounds. Secondly, if it's gone till the bones, that means osteomyelitis is there, which means the infection of the bones are there. Again, you have to clean the area. You have to make sure that the infection is not spreading. Uh, if the bones are, uh, you know, in a softer phase, you have to fuse them up. So uh, basically, it has a longer duration and a longer uh, time to take uh, healing also takes place because of the diabetes. So non-healing ulcers happen. But then again, if it's an infective one or a non-infective one, that's a basic criteria to judge uh, the how to treat that patient. Second question which I got is bone related complications of diabetes. So again, as I explained to you, the person doesn't know he walks. He may be having a fall and a fracture, but he doesn't know he still walks. So the complications are basically three fractures. Secondly is dislocations because of the fractures. Now you are still walking and you don't know there are uh, dislocations of the ankle of the calcaneus of the talus. Uh, and then uh, so fractures, dislocations. What I talked about is infection. You still go on walking. You have an ulcer. Dirt comes inside. Bacteria comes inside and uh, leads to infection of the bone, which is osteomyelitis. So these are the three basic complications of uh, bone related complications of uh, diabetes. And third is when do you go for amputation? So when the vascularity of the part or of the distal, uh, distal meaning the end part of the foot is not there, where you see that there is there's no blood going there. So the skin, uh, as it is, starts giving you signs. Uh, it becomes blackened. Uh, the bones start, uh, uh, you know, having that uh, sequestrum and osteomyelitic things. It, uh, so basically, you go for amputations when you know that this bone or this part is not going to survive. Uh, and uh, chances of keeping it is detrimental to the other bones or it may spread. That is when you go for uh, amputation. Uh, as of now, as newer technologies are going on, we are trying and uh, we have been men much successful that people who were going under undergoing amputations before have been now uh, kind of managed by offloading or fusion of the bones or operations where the stability is maintained and when we have taken out the infection in terms of uh, adding some antibiotics, stimulant, etc. So yes, the way is good, but yes, you need to take care and you need to manage your foot and your uh, uh, precautions, keep them dry, wash them regularly, notice them. Uh, be, having a partner with you, uh, noticing your foot always is a very good thing because sometimes uh, being a diabetic and having no sensations, uh, you might uh, just uh, overlook certain things. So these are basic three questions which were pertaining to orthopedics. I think if uh, there is something else that you would like to know, I would 100% uh, share it with you. Thank you. So, thank you, Dr. Pass. Uh, now I can take some of the questions. Uh, now, again, uh, there is one question that uh, how we are uh, managing the nutrition in a uh, diabetic food patient. So, the overall the general rule of uh, nutrition management in a diabetic food patient remains the same uh, as, as usually, which we are managing in our uh, regular diabetic patient. The two, three points we need to take care of is that the diabetic food patients are usually in a catabolic state. Uh, we have to provide with a good uh, protein diet and also the manage sugar well with uh, preferably with uh, anabolic agents like insulin so that uh, the healing process is not hampered. So these uh, two, three points apart from that the nutrition rules which we are following in a general diabetic population, uh, we are following the same rules for patients with a diabetic foot also. Uh, again, there is a question that for a pediatric obese patient, uh, whether the surgical approach of weight management is advisable or not. So uh, usually the surgical uh, management uh, by the bariatric surgery 
now has been advocated in a pediatric population also but not very young for patients uh, uh, at least uh, after age of 14 or 15 uh, definitely we can advise uh, in a in a right candidate for a bariatric surgery however the need for the lifestyle modification including the proper diet and exercise use of uh, medications for weight loss should be emphasized uh, before going to surgery before uh, because uh, after surgery patient uh, have to Uh, undergo the uh, intensive lifestyle management program so that the uh, in future the again weight gain is not going to uh, be there that needs to be taken care of and uh, surgical management has been used in a pediatric population uh, after uh, age of 14 or 15 years uh, again there is uh, one question regarding uh, uh what precautions do you take while treating or operating patients diabetes again whenever patient is going for uh, uh amputation uh, rather i would say ki uh, any surgery if patient is undergoing a diabetic patient uh, preferably we avoid any oral anti diabetic agent and we shift uh, patients on the insulin therapy uh it, it is usually a basal bolus therapy we usually prefer with uh, a long acting insulin uh, along with a short acting prandial insulin uh, this basal bolus therapy provide patients with a, a tighter glycemic control especially in the perioperative period so that the operative complication related to bad glycemic control uh, we can avoid a uh, patient needs to adhere to this uh, uh, intensive regime at least the wound or the surgical part has been healed and that also emphasize to the patient that uh, that uh, this intensive regime is not only for a temporary period of like uh, for in hospital only but patient may need to follow this intensive regime at home also so that uh, glycemic control remains in a good shape uh, i think uh, all the questions has been taken care so uh, so basically uh, diabetes is a very uh, uh, disease which has to be taken care of it cannot be taken lightly and uh, in terms of endocrine or this line of the we have said that uh, other things need to be taken care of properly and when it comes to the orthopedic side when the bones and things are involved it's best to have plan to go to an institute where overall uh, things can be taken care of like for my all surgeries of diabetic patient dr vivek is always there is always involved uh, so someone asked what the uh, what, what are the precautions that you take and what is the protocol so we have set protocols where everything in diabetes other than the bony surgery in orthopedics is managed by dr vivek we have anesthetists also and physicians also and that is why you get a overall one stop solution at one place which has everything so it's always better to uh, you know be associated with hospitals which have one stop solutions you don't have to call doctors from somewhere else and that is why we uh, whenever we have a patient has diabetes we are we are rest assured that dr vivek is there and he is going to take care of everything i just have to take care of the bone part similarly for him i guess it's it would be the same thing that he would be taking care of everything related to diabetes and if there is something related to the bone he knows that dr parth is there so i think that is what i would conclude that always have a, a proper guidance and a proper place uh, where you have all the things combined so you don't have to run here and there or call people from outside and uh, get confusions or a delay in your treatment that's it from my side thank you thank you i i would like to thank all the participants who have joined this uh, uh, gic sims webinar series and uh, i hope that uh, this this lectures would uh, help you in in in, uh, in managing your diabetic patients especially elderly diabetic patients or the diabetic foot patients uh, in a better way uh, thank you thank you all thank you very much